The best-selling book, Sapiens, by Yuval Noah Harari, examined how our species came to dominate the Earth and was read and recommended by notables from President Obama to Bill Gates. Now Harari has written a follow-up book, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, examining what our species may pursue next. And Yuval Harari joins us now. Welcome, Yuval. So wonderful to have Hello. you here with us. <laughs> it's good to be here. So in Sapiens, you wrote such a sweeping history of the human race. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, as a historian, since historians usually focus on a single movement or a period, why you decided to write such a sweeping history? Because to answer some of the big questions of history, you have to look at the whole picture. If you ask questions like, uh, are humans today happier than they were in the past? You have to look at thousands of years. If you ask, for example, why men have dominated women in almost all human societies, if you just study, uh, I don't know, China in the 12th century, you won't get the answer. So some, um, some questions simply demand a very long-term right. broad view of history. And so there seems to be a lot of um, a, an evolutionary reason for a lot of what we do. Mm -hmm. But at this period in time, have we reached a sort of post evolutionary period because technology is moving so quickly? Yes, I think that um, after really four billion years that life on Earth was dominated by natural selection, now it's beginning to be dominated by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds, our intelligent design is now the most important force of the evolution of life. Um, and even more fundamental rules of life are about to be broken. For four billion years, all of life was confined to the organic realm. It doesn't matter if you're a dinosaur or a tomato or a human being, you were made of organic compounds. Now we are about to create the first inorganic life forms after four billion years of evolution. That's something quite dramatic. It is dramatic. And does that perhaps explain why there is a sense of anxiety, because on the one hand, for human beings, things have never been better, right, as you write in your book? Yes, I mean, for the first time in history, more people die today from eating too much than from eating too little, which is a great achievement. Uh, more people die from old age than from infectious diseases. And actually, more people commit suicide than are killed by human violence. Uh, and this is not because suicide rates are so high, it's because human violence is at an all times low. So all of this seems to be great for the species, for our race, but yet we are filled with anxiety over the future. Is that because of all the questions that technology is posing? It's partly because of that. I mean, it's partly because much of our achievements have been done at the expense of the ecological system, and we are now facing an ecological disaster. But it's also because of the rise of new disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence and bioengineering. And nobody really knows, for example, what the job market would look like in 30 years. It's the first time in history when we just have no idea what kind of jobs, if any, so people as a, will have in 30 years. So as a parent, I have anxiety because I don't know what to tell my child to be. Should you exactly. be a lawyer, I mean, a doctor, an engineer? I don't know. I mean, most jobs that exist today probably won't exist right. in 30, 40 years. So if your kids come to you and ask, what should I study in school? You don't know what to tell them. You don't know. I mean, in the Middle Ages, you knew. I mean, you know, you, you learn to harvest the corn, you learn to be a carpenter, you'll have a job. Even in the 20th century, you knew. But today, for the first time in history, we have no idea what to teach kids. It's quite obvious that most of what they learn at school will be completely irrelevant by the time they are 40. Now, is that part of why we are seeing sort of a, a shift in the global story of humanity? One of the points that you make is that hu as human beings, we need to tell stories. Yeah. We need to believe in a collective story. Mm -hmm. And our collective story has been the rise of globalization and a sort of liberalization or secularism of social life. Mm -hmm. That seems to have been the story we've been believing for a while, and that seems to be falling apart at this moment in time, as this populism and nationalism grows around the world. Yeah, there is a backlash. Um, I think mainly because that local communities are falling apart and because humans are uh, really losing touch even with their bodies. 
we more and more experience reality through screens. We are far less attentive mm -hmm. to what we actually feel and hear and smell. And instead, we are engaged with things that are happening elsewhere some other time. And if you lose touch with your body, you are disoriented, you feel alienated. Uh, I think these are the, the, the really root causes mm -hmm. of this feeling of fear and discontent that we see around us. And you write about the three possible pursuits that as human beings we will probably focus our energies on going forward. Mm -hmm. One is immortality. Yes, that's the, the hottest wor word in Silicon Valley is not equality, it's immortality. <laughs> when equality is out, immortality is in. Do you really think that we can achieve immortality at some point in the future? Uh, at some point, yes. Not in our lifetime. Sorry to disappoint. <laughs> I, at least this is my view. I don't, right. But I think that you know, like 40 years, it's too soon. But 100 years, 200 years, I think a baby born today may have a fighting chance of living indefinitely if she or he have enough money to finance the relevant treatments. You bring up a good point. Money, the class divide, will that continue to become a bigger problem going forward? If we go, uh, if we continue with our present policies, then yes. Mm -hmm. Then it's likely that in the 21st century, we will create the most unequal societies that ever existed. Partly because for the first time in history, it will be possible to translate economic inequality into biological inequality. With the help of bioengineering, uh, you could create different biological castes, which is, was never possible before. Is part of this what you mean when you say we will pursue a sort of divinity? Yes. I mean, uh, when I said that humans will try to upgrade themselves into gods, and the, the title of the book, Homo Deus, it means divine man or, or god man, I mean this literally, not as a metaphor, that we are in the process of acquiring divine powers of creation. If in the Bible, God creates animals and plants and humans according to his wishes, now we learn how to engineer and manufacture life according to our wishes, I think the main products of the 21st century economy will be bodies and brains and minds. And you say that China has an advantage over Western societies in this regard because of its philosophical history? Partly, it has less of a baggage. I mean, the, the, uh, in the West, you have all this, I think, very positive baggage of humanism and privacy and individualism, and this limits uh, our willingness to experiment, for example, with bioengineering. In other places around the world, like in East Asia, there is uh, less inhibition in this respect. So do you think that they will lead the economic charge in this part of science? Uh, there is a good chance. For instance, if you think about the genetics market, so it's all based on statistics. To know what a particular gene does, you need statistics on millions of people. Um, in the West, there is an issue of privacy. I mean, to build a big data bank of millions of DNA and, uh, and how they are connected with human achievement, uh, there is a big issue of privacy. But in a place like China, there is far less issue with privacy. And the first corporation or the first institution to create a huge database of genetics will corner the market. In the same way that Facebook cornered the market of social media, the first corporation or institution to have a huge database of genetics will corner the market because it's all statistics. So everybody will go there because they already have better data than all the competitors, and then they'll have even more data and that's the end of the story. Fascinating. Now, you say a baby born today with the means may live forever. What about the rest of us? How many generations do the rest of Homo sapiens have if we continue to use the environment the way we're using it and not ask the big questions about the technology? I think in such a case, then we have maybe a century or two at most. I think we are one of the last generations of Homo sapiens. Uh, not necessarily that the robots will come and kill us, like in some Hollywood science fiction movie. It's more that uh, some Homo sapiens will be upgraded using technology into something else, something more different from us than we are different from Neanderthals. And the rest of the Homo sapiens will be left behind and, and become increasingly powerless and irrelevant. 
um, like the chimpanzees or the gorillas. So there will be a tiny master race somehow moving forward. Could be, again, I mean, there is nothing deterministic about it. It depends on our choices. Uh, if you look at the 20th century, so you see that the same technology of electricity and radio and cars could be used to create a communist dictatorship or a liberal democracy. People had some choice what to do with electricity and trains. It's the same with the 21st century. Um, bioengineering and artificial intelligence do not determine a single social outcome. We still have some choice. But do you think that the scientists and the engineers and the people at the forefront of this technology are asking the right questions about it? They are beginning to ask the right questions, but it's, it's, I think it's too slow and they don't, have the, they don't have the regulatory power to do much about it. Uh, it will be very difficult for the industries to regulate themselves. And our partly politicians because, aren't forward-looking right now. And exactly, and the yeah. political system is hardly aware of what's happening. Like I, I looked at the, at the election campaign in the US in 2016. So even when they talk about the job market, uh, you have Donald Trump frightening people that the Mexicans will take your jobs. He never said AI will take your jobs. And looking 30 years to the future, AI is a far greater threat to the job market than Mexico or China. If you build a wall, maybe you should build a wall on the border with California, not on the border with, with, with Mexico. <laughs> I, this is, of yeah, course, a joke. I mean, you, you, yeah, can't sol you can't solve it with a wall. But I was very much disturbed that nobody really talked about this issue of the potential threat to the job market from machine learning and AI and so forth. Yes, no politicians seem to be addressing that anywhere. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm, I'm not apocalyptic. Oh. I, there are things to do, but we should start thinking and doing it because, you know, if, if you think that, okay, all the jobs, I don't know, in, in, in industry will be taken over by robots, but we will need more software engineers, so are we teaching uh, t children today in Bangladesh or Nigeria to be software engineers so that they will have a job in 20 years or not? We should do it today, Absolutely. not in 20 years, and we are not doing it. Yuval, I could talk to you about this all day. Yuval, thank you so much for coming in to see us today. Fascinating. Thank you. <laughs>